اعوذ باللہ السمیع العلیم من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمدللہ رب العالمین الحمدللہ والحمد حقه کما یستحقه حمدا کثیرا وأعوذ به من شر نفسي إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء إلا ما رحم ربي والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وأما من خاف مقام ربه ونهى النفس عن الهوى الجنة هي المأوى آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls and the enlightenment of the hearts and for the hastening of the reappearance of بقية الله الأعظم روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء in Latin your souls in the atmosphere with the recitation of صلوات upon محمد وآل محمد Respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. She was carrying a water container. And at the same time, she was busy looking after her children. Amir al-Mu'mineen came towards her, asked her if she needed any assistance. She replied back by saying that indeed I do because my husband was taken by Ali and was killed in the battlefield. At that moment, Amir al-Mu'mineen picks up the children, takes and helps this lady to get to her house. When he gets inside the house, he says to her, how, am I, how can I be of assistance to you? She says that I need to feed them and I do not have any food for them. He goes out of the house, he purchases some flour and some dates and some meat. He carries it on his shoulders on his way to the house of this lady. People see him. They say, Ya Amir al Mu'mini, should we help you? He responds by saying, Who will help me on the day of judgment? When he gets inside, he says to this lady, what would you like me to do? She responds back by saying that I will prepare the meat. I want you to feed the children. May Allah bless you. At that moment when she hasn't recognized who she was dealing with, Amir al-Mu'mineen starts to feed her children and says, Oh so and so, forgive Ali ibn Abi Talib. Later on she comes and tells him, Why do you not bake the bread? He comes in, places the flour inside the oven, feels the heat and says, Oh Ali, feel the pain of the punishment as some of your subjects are not happy with you. When an individual comes inside the house, recognizes who this man was, says to this lady, do you know who this man is? She says, no. This person says, this is the Khalifa of the Muslims, Ali ibn Abi Talib. The lady is embarrassed and ashamed. She comes to Amir al-Mu'mineen and says, Ya Ali, forgive me. I had no idea it was you. Amir al-Mu'mineen responds back by saying, but it is you who should forgive me in case I have not fulfilled your rights and what I have to do for you. This story, as it's very well known, is an indication of the excellence and the sublime moral conduct of the commander of the faithful Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. In other words, what we have in history today is abundance of such stories illustrating his excellence in many fields. It's surprising at the onset to mention that we have a number of such narrations and at the same time stories which are inspirational about Ali ibn Abi Talib. 
despite the fact that history was written by his enemies. If you were to examine many historians today, you'll see that a large majority of them were individuals who despised Ali ibn Abi Talib. And at the same time, they would either want to speak badly about him or attribute his fadail to whom? To his enemies. Just like how Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan came forward to Samar ibn Jundub and said to him that when it comes to any narration praising Ali ibn Abi Talib, I want you to place it for his enemies. So for instance, there is a narration that says the ayah in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara. Do not approach prayers and you're under the effect of intoxicants. Samara writes, this was revealed because Ali ibn Abi Talib came to pray and he was drunk. Likewise, for 75 years, we have narrations that tell us that the name of Ali ibn Abi Talib was cursed from the member, from the pulpits in the mosques across the different areas in the Muslim world. Therefore, despite the existence of this, and some of the historians actually say, Ma naf'alu bi bi Ali. We don't know how we deal with Ali. In habbnahu qutilna. If we love Ali ibn Abi Talib, we'll be killed. Wa in baghdnahu, what? Kafarna. Why? Ya Ali, la yuhibbuka illa mu'min, wa la yubghidhuka illa munafiq. Anyone who loves you, Ali, is truly a believer. And anyone who hates you is a hypocrite. Yet despite all this animosity towards Ali ibn Abi Talib, we are indeed blessed to have so many such narrations which need to be looked at and examined in order for us to reap the fruits and the benefits from this great personality. Such as the narration from the Holy Sixth Imam who says from my father, from his father, that a man came to Amir al-Mu'mineen and said to him, Ya Ali, kayfa arafta rabbik? Tell me, how have you got to know your Lord? This ma'rif of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how did you attain it? Amir al-Mu'mineen responds back by saying, The way I have recognized that there is a Lord is through the following. That tomorrow I have a plan. I want to go somewhere. Next week I have another plan. That I plan and I fulfill or do whatever is necessary for that plan to go ahead. Yet what I realize is that things are not in my hands. That our external influences have an impact upon this actually happening or not. And therefore Amir al-Mu'mineen says, I know Allah exists because my plans are sabotaged. They do not necessarily go ahead. And therefore, I know there is a mudabbir. There is a creator who is in control of everything. And this is, by the way, a statement today used by the theologians as one of the proofs for the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If there was no creator, then why is it that you and I cannot plan accordingly for our actions and execute them at the same time? Tell me, how many of us have had a certain objective in life and it hasn't gone ahead as planned? Therefore, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, I know Allah exists through this and many other ways that he answers in several other narrations. The man said to him, how have you thanked his ni'mah? He says, when I look at bala, when I look at the trials and the tribulations, I recognize that Allah has inflicted upon few individuals some calamities and I am free from them. Therefore, I thank him for the fact that I don't have to go through what they're going. The man then asks him, Ya Ali, why is it that you want to meet your Lord? Why is it that you want to meet him? The response was, because I recognize that he has honored me by making me follow the religion of his angels and the religion of his prophets and messengers. And I am aware that he wants the best for me. Therefore, he will not forget me. And consequently, I love to meet him. These are all gems from the treasures of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And... The way you and I can truly benefit from his life and his teachings. Yet when it comes to examining 
his illustrious life, one thing that comes forward is arguably what stood out in the life of Ali was his connection with the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. In other words, his courage, his valor, his generosity, the way he dealt with people justly are all wonderful attributes. Yet arguably some scholars come forward and say that the spirituality of Ali ibn Abi Talib is that which needs to be examined and looked at in order for people to understand how a human being who is a true servant of Allah connects with his creator, the only beloved, subhanahu wa ta'ala. When it comes to Ali ibn Abi Talib, look at what George Jodak, the famous Christian author of the book known as Ali, the voice of human justice, who by the way, this author is coming to the United Kingdom next month. I am told that he has written this wonderful book, which is very much encouraged for people to read and to examine. In this book, he narrates this hadith, which is also found in both Sunni and Shia books of hadith, which says that Ali Imam Ali alayhi salam was mentioned by the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. The Prophet says that if you want to look at the knowledge of Adam, and if you want to have the determination of Nuh, and the habit of Ibrahim, and the dua of Musa, and the taqwa of Isa, and the huda of Muhammad, the guidance of the Holy Prophet, then look at the man who's coming from the door now. And at that moment, Ali ibn Abi Talib walks in. In other words, what? In other words, Amir al muminin was a man who encompassed these sciences and more. Yet the spirituality emerged. And therefore, the subject of the examination for tonight's lecture is to seek some lessons from the spiritual life of Ali ibn Abi Talib as we commemorate his shahada. In other words, what I want to examine is the following. That if you look at our lives and one angle from the spiritual lessons from Imam alayhi salam is what you and I need the most in our life which is considered the essential prerequisite for success in the lives of human beings. What is that? Examine individuals who have become successful before our own eyes or in history. Look at the Olympics that is being staged at the moment. Those athletes that have won gold medals Muhammad Farah, the one who represents the Great Britain team, who won the gold medal. Usain Bolt, who won two gold medals in the 100 meters and the 200 meters, who incidentally performed the sajda after his triumph when he finished the 100 meters, despite the fact that he was Christian. Yet some people have benefited from the lessons from the religion of Islam. In other words, he has come to recognize that this sajda is a means of gratitude to God the Almighty. You look at others like Andy Murray and, and other sports individuals or even successful businessmen like whom Steve Jobs or Bill Gates. What is the common denominator that brings forward all these successful human beings as far as worldly gain is concerned? What is it that they all have that you and I also want to have? Is it the ability to run or the ability to design a computer? Or is it an ability to, for instance, play a specific sport in a certain type of way? No. What you and I desire that these individuals have developed in themselves is willpower. The ability to perform certain actions. In other words, today willpower, according to many scientists and psychologists, is defined as what? Is defined as the battle between what we do and what we ought to do. Between delaying short-term desires in order to achieve long-term goals, this notion of self-discipline and attaining willpower is indeed quite important and significant for the success of the human being. Notice that nobody in the history of mankind was able to achieve anything of noteworthy measure unless and until they had strong will and were able to discipline themselves in the right manner. And today, one of the problems that you and I face is that we complain of a weak will. 
Most of us say that when it comes to temptations, when it comes to disobedience, when it comes to matters that we wish to stay away from, we are unable to do so. Why? Because we are not able to control ourselves. And the temptations overpower us. The question that here is presented is, look at before these athletes, the prophets, prophets of Allah mentioned in the Quran, all shared this commonality and that they had excellent willpower, strong determination. Look at Nuh, 950 years, he did what? He built the ark. Despite the mockery, despite the fact that people were laughing at him and were saying that they, are you wasting your time? He did not listen to them and continued. Look at Ibrahim on two occasions at least. When it came to destroying the idols, he was not faced by the pressure. When it came to leaving his wife Hajar, where? In Mecca, this barren desert. He at the same time did that without any hesitation. Therefore, he displayed strong willpower and the discipline. Likewise, look at Musa, the way he dealt with Bani Israel. Many of us would have given up after the first incident. Look at, for instance, Isa and his asceticism. Look at the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. When the Prophet was presented with this option that he will become the head of Quraysh, that he will attain whatever he wanted. As far as worldly gaze is concerned, what did he say? He said, by Allah, if they were to give me the sun on my right hand and the moon on my left, so that I abandon this mission, I will never do so until Allah fulfills it or I die before it. Meaning what? Meaning that the determination and the willingness to perform the action was perfect. Look at Ali ibn Abi Talib. On the night of the Hijrah of the Holy Prophet, Rasulullah comes and says to him, Ya Ali, sleep on my bed. Now put yourself in the position of Amir al-Mu'mineen. The majority of us will say to the Prophet, possibly, Ya Rasulullah, I'm an important person. You know, I've defended you and I'll stand next to you. Why don't you put someone else? Look for someone else, anyone else. Why does it have to be me? As long as they know it's not you, then you'll get away with it, true? That we might argue with the Prophet. We'll say, why should I sacrifice my life? Amir al-Mu'mineen had that determination and willpower to come to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, there's one thing that I'm asking. Are you going to be safe? Because that's what he cares about. It's the safety of Rasulullah and the religion of Islam. The Prophet said, indeed, I will be safe. Then Amir al-Mu'mineen had no hesitation. When he went and he slept in the bed of the Prophet, do you know what the narration tells us? The narration tells us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Jibra'il and Mika'il, he said to these two angels, close angels, I want to sacrifice one of you so that the other remains alive. Which one would you sacrifice yourself for the other? None of them will come forward. Allah then will say, look at my servant Ali. He, had sac he wants to sacrifice himself for the protection of my servant Rasulullah. And at that moment, Jibra'il comes and descends on this earth and says, Bakhin, Bakhin, Laka ya Ali ibn Abi Talib. Man mithlak, who is like you? Wallahu yubahi bika malaikatu sama. Allah is showing you off to the angels of the heavens. Why? Because of willpower. The question is, today there are many websites, books, tutorials, sessions that are staged in order for people to develop their willpower. Because it's an essential skill. And many people ask the question, how do we do it? How do we become individuals who are strong-willed and are able to defeat our temptations? Because it doesn't have to be when it comes to spirituality or connection with Allah. It could mean anything in life as far as temptations, as far as, for instance, food or drink or certain habits that you and I have developed. People are seeking continuously the ability to develop their willpower. If you were to examine some of the works that are presented around the world today, you'll find that one of the best books that talks about willpower is by a professor known as Professor Roy Warmister. He's from the University of Florida. He's written a book entitled Willpower, Examining the Greatest Human Strength. 
the greatest human strength. What does he say? Before looking at Islamic teachings and specifically the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib when it comes to willpower, especially in the month of Ramadan. This professor says that willpower is a muscle. Is what? A muscle, albeit a mental one that can be strengthened at the same time weakened. In his book, and to save you buying it, I will tell you of a number of points that he has listed as far as tips for strengthening willpower. He says, after several years of study and writing articles and experiments, he comes forward and says that strengthening willpower needs to start small. In other words, you see, when it comes to New Year's resolutions, many people list a number of points that they want to develop. True? That they want to better themselves at the beginning of the year. Scientists tell us, begin small. Why? So that you can achieve realistic targets. You can notify and look at what you want to achieve and therefore do not overburden yourself with huge lists because then you will not be able to, ha to have the strength to continue, number one. Number two, and quite interestingly, he says, avoid and seek the cause of the temptation and remove it from existence. Meaning what? He says, for instance, if you watch TV excessively, go to the TV and take the socket out and place the socket in a drawer. Because next time that you want to come and watch the television, you think with yourself, you have to go, take the socket out of the drawer, plug it into the electric, electric uh, plug, and at the same time this may somewhat delay you or m may not give you the strength to go and do it. Likewise, he says, if you're on Facebook too much, this is his suggestion by the way, he says, if you're on Facebook too much, what should you do? I wonder what everybody here is thinking, what this man is saying you should be doing. He says, install a program that every time you go on Facebook, it reminds you. It says to you, warning, you're on Facebook. And if you do not follow the warnings of this program, install a program that blocks Facebook. Back in certain countries around the world, you are unable to access Facebook. In other words, look for the cause. Sometimes in our lives, we put ourselves in situations whereby we are tempted more to fall into the pits or whatever we don't want to fall into. Like what? I remember this famous Iraqi series or soap opera known as what? Known as Abusi. Some of you may have seen it. I recall when I was young, I watched it. This man by the name of Abusi comes to school in order to learn how to read and write, despite the fact that he knew how to read and write. When he sits in the school, and this was produced maybe 40, 50 years ago, when he comes inside the school, he notices that there are a number of other adults who were there. And one of the adults had bought with them what? They had bought with them a huge container, having what? Having a special type of food known as kubba. So when he sits there, the teacher is teaching. He stands up, this Abusi, and goes, opens the pan and starts eating the food. The teacher tells him, how dare you? You're not in a cafe or in a restaurant. You're in a class. You're supposed to adhere to the etiquettes. He responds back by saying, Ustad, shasawi rihat al khashmi. Oh my teacher, what can I do? The smell of the kubba is in my nose. In other words, if there is a temptation there, you need to remove it in order for the path to become clearer. Likewise, a lot of our brothers and sisters complain. I remember at university, one of the brothers who continuously spent a great deal of time discussing and talking and spending a few hours with the opposite gender, and he was a Muslim and a follower of the Ahl al-Bayt, he would come to me and he would say to me, how do you do it? You know, I find them in front of me all the time that I have no control over the fact that they chat with me and I have to chat with them. Good akhlaq. So he said to me, how do I avoid speaking unnecessarily with the opposite gender? It's simple. We must not be able to put ourselves in this position. The moment we give the green light, the moment we are able to go forward and engage free 
in times in terms of free mixing and developing this habit of what this habit of ease between the genders then of course many will have developed this problem which is conversation with the opposite gender which is unnecessary therefore this man this professor says remove the obstacle thirdly he says develop what develop good habits and stick to them and make them a routine like what he says how many of us when we leave in the morning to go to work or wherever we want to go we stand in front of the mirror we want to make sure we're presentable it's become a habit it's something that we do not need to remind ourselves likewise he says develop a systematic approach to certain aspects therefore it becomes part of your conduct fourthly and all importantly he says associate yourself with the right crowd the crowd that give you positive encouragement not those who are continuously despondent and make you feel low because you know sometimes we associate ourselves with certain friends and companions who tell us that there is no point who continuously radiate this type of negative feeling and therefore what we find ourselves is we lose the will we're not surrounding ourselves with the right crowd these are some of the instructions provided by some of the scientists yet if you were to come to the religion of islam and specifically to, to the teachings of the holy prophet and the imma you will find a number of wonderful instructions recommendations when it comes to strengthening willpower let's have a look at them and i need your attention for a few moments in order for this examination to be practical and in order for us to see where should we look for in a, to, so that our willpower becomes strong islam comes forward and says if you want to strengthen your will then you need to develop an understanding of a principle known as Meaning what? It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and has created the soul. And there is a dimension of the soul which is known as an nafsul ammara bisu. The dimension of the soul that commands us to perform evil. This is like a wild animal. It needs to be controlled. It needs to be tamed and domesticated. It needs to be under the control of the human being. In other words, the Arafa and the scholars of spirituality, they say that when it comes to this element of the soul, it's like a horse which has gone wild. What we need to do is, as a rider of the horse, control it and not let the horse take us wherever it wants to take us. This element of self-control by recognizing that our soul needs to be tamed, needs to be kept under our leash is an important prerequisite when it comes to attaining strong willpower. Number one. Number two, what we are told is that when it comes to this idea of willpower, you will not be able to attain it except what except if you recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of it in which way you are told that Allah tabaraka wa ta'ala in the holy quran uses a term by the name of azza azza means what alladhina yabta alladhina yattabi'una al-kafirin awliya'a min dun al-mu'minin those who seek the disbelievers as what? As means of authority over the believers. You need to recognize that if you want strong willpower, it comes from Allah. And imagine as a believer, you're already on a journey. You're already in a position which is more advanced than a non-believer. Why? The fact that you have Iman means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you this Izzah. Izzah means what? In the Arabic language, it means strength. It means some kind of power that the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Now the recognition is given that if you want strong willpower, then you need to have determination to have strong willpower. Al-irada li al-irada. 
Meaning that you need to set yourself a clear goal and a target that I want to strengthen my willpower. Yet how will I do it? First and foremost, by associating yourself with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By praying to the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. By recognizing that without His help, we will not be able to have strong willpower and develop self-discipline. That everything comes from Him. Any other teaching out there that tells you you can become strong-willed without referring and returning to the Almighty is short-term, is transient. Islamic teachings tell us, no, submit yourself and rely on Allah conclusively and you will attain the first path towards becoming a strong-willed person. In which way? Look at Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. One day he had six dirhams. When he had six dirhams, he was going to buy some food. On his way, he saw a poor man begging. And you know when Ali sees a poor man or a woman, he doesn't hesitate. In fact, the Ahl al-Bayt, when anyone comes and asks them for anything, they do not hesitate. Have you ever wondered why Ali ibn Abi Talib in the battlefield, when he is fighting an individual, and that person's sword is lost, and that man says to Ali, Ya Ali, give me your sword. Allahu Akbar. In the battlefield, he's asking for the sword. Amir al-Mu'mineen gives him the sword. In the heat of the battle. That man's surprised. He says, Ya Ali, I'm fighting you and I don't have anything to defend myself. And I've asked you for the sword and you give me your sword. Why? Amir al-Mu'mineen says, because I'm embarrassed before Allah that you've asked me for something and I will not give it to you. Even in the battlefield, they'll give. They are the epitome of generosity and mercy. So this man asks and says, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, give me some money. Amir al-Mu'mineen looks at his pocket, he has six dirhams. He's supposed to buy some food, he gives the six dirhams. Imam al-Hassan and Hussein and Sayyida Fatima are waiting at home for some food. What does he do? He's walking past and he finds an individual who's selling a camel. He says to him, how much will you sell this camel for? He said, 140 dirhams. He said, I'm a, I'll, I'll buy it, but I'll give you the money later. This man said, no problem, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, you take the camel. When Amir al-Mu'mineen took the camel, he was walking with the camel, a man came to him and said, Ya Ali, will you sell this camel? And he said, yes, I'll sell it. Amir al-Mu'mineen said, how much would you like to pay for it? This man said, I'll pay 200 dirhams. He said, no problem. He gave him 200. Amir al-Mu'mineen gave 140 to that man we had bought the camel from and came back with 60 dirhams. He came to the house and said, look, I left the house with six dirhams, I came back with 60. Do you know why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man jaa bil hasanati falahu ashru amthadiha. Whomsoever comes with one good deed, Allah times it by 10. And I, was, I went out with six, I came back with 60. Imagine an individual who relies on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will not abandon him or her. Number one. Number two, Amir al-Mu'mineen says to you and I, إِنَّمَا هِيَ نَفْسِي أَرُوذُهَا or أَرَوِّذُهَا بِالتَّقْوَى It's my soul and I know how to exercise it. Remember, it's a muscle. It needs to be exercised. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, I know how to deal with it. I know how to make it strong will. I do it through taqwa, through God consciousness. The fact that 240 times the Quran speaks about taqwa. The fact that the majority of the sermons of Amir al-Mu'mineen in Nahj al balagha speak about taqwa. The fact that Amir al-Mu'mineen was Imam al-Muttaqeen, the leader of the God conscious and the leader of the pious. Meaning what? Meaning that if you want to have strong willpower, then you need to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have you ever pondered and thought with yourself that when it comes to this idea, these teachings truly enlighten our hearts, that it's not simply doing X, Y, and Z, but it's part of a holistic picture that you and I need to be part of. The teachings tell us that taqwa Allah is a prerequisite for developing strong willpower. I recall that in the prisons of the dictator in Iraq, we are told that there was a man who was tortured, one of the believers. When he was tortured, they said to him, tell us the names of those who are working with you against the government, against the tyrannical oppressive regime. He said, if you want the names, they're inside my heart here. Come and get them. What kind of willpower did he have? All kinds of vicious means of torture. 
humiliation, intimidation were used. He didn't say a word. Finally, they tore him into pieces. Yet who had the strong will? Who was stronger in the eyes of Allah? The one who had executed and tortured this believer or the believer himself? Of course, it's the believer himself. Why? Because he developed taqwa. Because he knew that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching him at all times. He is as sami'u al-basir and therefore he had that reliance and strength to remain steadfast when push came to shove. Number two, look at these lessons that we're going through. Number three, we are told that Amir al-Mu'mineen salamullahi alayhi tells you and I to develop willpower, you need to do what? If you dislike something and if you're fearful of something, then do it. It means what? It means that the Quran speaks about an important principle that I want your attention for a few minutes. Allah says, Scholars come forward and say, our souls tend towards the leisure and luxury and comfort. We want to be at ease in the majority of our lives, true? They say that if you want to control it, if you want to tame it, if you want to be the rider who is in control of the horse, you need to do the following. The true at times of temptation, when there is a sin before you, it's sometimes very strong to say no. But where you start is you say no to things which are mubah, things which are halal. Meaning what? Meaning that you're tired, you've come back home and you're tired and you're thinking with yourself, I'll go to sleep. You say, no, I won't go to sleep. You're sending a message and a signal to the nafsul ammara to bisu that you're in control, that you do not do whatever it tempts you to do. You're sitting amongst a group of people. You see, because there's a hadith, a beautiful hadith from a man by the name of Anwan al-Basri, from the sixth Imam, Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, which says, وَأَمَّا مَا فِي الرِّيَاضَةِ This exercise of the soul, this idea of the riyadah to ruh We are told that Imam al-Sadiq says, if you want to know how to exercise your soul, then control, for instance, what you're eating. How? Do not eat except when you're hungry. And when you're presented with food, if you do not have any desire for the food, don't eat it. And eat only that which is halal and begin the food with Bismillah. Imam Ali salam gives a number of wonderful recommendations. This hadith is beautiful. If you have time, research it. Hadith of Anwan al-Basri. What we are recommended to do is that when it comes to normal procedures in our lives, we need to press the pause button and say no to ourselves in order to develop the ability to say no to things which are harder later on when we are in those situations. When we are in a tempting situation, if we had said no to ourselves. Remember, if you say yes to your desires all the time, if whatever you want you always get, then when it comes to Salatul Fajr, when you need to wake up, you won't, you won't wake up. Why? Because your soul will tell you, it's okay, there's a few more minutes left, remain in the bed. When it comes to, for instance, performing Salatul Layl, you're tired, you've got work next day or school next day, or whatever you have next day, say, you know what, allow it, I'll leave it today. In other words, if you continuously listen to your desires, then you become a slave to it. And when you become a slave to it, it becomes easy to commit the sins and the transgressions and the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like how that individual who I think, who I've mentioned many times in lectures before, who lived in the time of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, who had a special ability. He was a Christian and what he used to do was people who used to come to him and he used to tell them what they're hiding inside the palms of their hands. In other words, he had a sense of the knowledge of the unseen. He was a Christian and therefore people started to doubt their faith as Muslims. They came to Imam al-Sadiq and said, Ya ibn Rasulillah, he's a Christian and he's performing a miracle. Come to the help of the religion. So Imam al-Sadiq summoned him. He said, oh man, how have you reached this position? How have you been able to develop 
this ability to see what's inside the hands of people. He said, I have controlled myself and I am one who says no to my desires. So in the summer, if I want to drink cold water, I drink hot water. If I, for instance, don't want to read a book, I read the book. By the way, don't get me wrong. This is not part of halal and haram. I don't want anyone to come and think that I'm saying you're not allowed to drink cold water in the summer. No, this is for those who want to develop strong self-discipline and willpower. To be able to be in control of their desires. That not give in at the earliest temptation. So as soon as I've done this, I was able to see what's inside the people's hands. Imam alayhi salam said, tell me what's inside my hands now. That man became hesitant. He started to shake. He lowered his head. Imam al-Sadiq said to him, tell me why are you not saying anything? He said, it's because I can see part of Jannah inside your hands. He said, you're absolutely right. What I have inside my hands is part of Karbala, dust from Karbala. And indeed, it is part of heaven. Now, what is your soul telling you to do? This man said, my soul is telling me, run away. Because if I stay with you, you're going to make me a Muslim. Imam said, didn't you tell me that you don't listen to your soul and desires and do the opposite? He said, yeah, that's a good point. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. He became a Muslim. Next day he went. People came to him. You know, people love these kind of things. They look for it. They came to him and said, oh man, tell us what's inside our hands. He said, I don't know. He lost the ability. He came to Imam Sadiq. Ya Allah, I became a Muslim and I lost it. Imam said, yes, there is a reason. Because Allah loved what you used to do. Because you controlled your nafs. And therefore he gave you this ability in this world. Now that you've become a Muslim, your reward is with him in Akhirah. And he's taken this away from you. Which means what? Which means something which is legislated in Islamic teachings. Islam doesn't say kill your desire like the Hindus and some Christians. Islam says control your whims and see the difference. That's number three. Number four, the fourth practical point so that we can take lessons home is what? Is self-accountability. That if you and I continuously hold ourselves responsible for what we do, the next time we'll do it, we will think twice. In which way? Hold yourself accountable before you'll be held accountable on the day of judgment. Allama Tabatabai, the author of Tafsir al Mizan, on his final few moments, somebody came to him and said, Can you give us a piece of advice? He said, Alikum bil muraqaba, Alikum bil muhasaba, make sure you supervise yourself, make sure you hold yourself accountable once in a week, once in a day, once in a month, once in a year in the month of Ramadan. Because the month of Ramadan is the month of accountability. Just like how most of us have accountants when we work, the month of Ramadan is an opportunity to go through our deeds and to hold ourselves responsible and to scrutinize our actions. Yet there is a tip that I want to present to you here. What is that? How will I control myself from doing that which I've sought repentance for that I do not wish to do again? God forbid I've watched something that I shouldn't have. I've had a relationship with someone that I shouldn't. I've listened to music. I've used drugs. I've done anything which is the source of disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can I somewhat control or force myself from doing it again? There is a technique that's been recommended, which is what? Known as nether. That you come forward and say, Lillahi alayhi. There is a sigha, there is a way of doing it. You say, Lillahi alayhi. It is incumbent and Allah is witness over myself that if I was to do this once more, I will, for instance, pay 1,000 pounds to the orphans. Or I will pray 10 days worth of salah. Or, for instance, I will perform a certain action. Now, if you have this hanging over you, the next time you come and you get close to that temptation and you may fall in the pits and the trap of the shaitan, you remember, if I do this, I'm going to pay a thousand pounds. And you know what? I don't have a thousand pounds and I don't want to do it. It becomes a means by which you are stopped. A means by which you are discouraged. 
And that's how we need to do things. We need to remind ourselves, place obstacles between us and the disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's number four. I'm going through them very briefly due to short of time. Number five, we are told one way that we can do this is through talqeen. Talqeen is what? Talqeen is done before an individual passes away. And when they've just passed away, and when they've put inside the grave. Yet there is a special type of talqeen that you and I do. Continuously remind ourselves about what we wish to do. Have notifications on our phones and on the walls and wherever we see it. Remind ourselves, encourage ourselves, make ourselves confident, boost our ability in order to have and develop strong willpower. And this continuous reminding of oneself is crucial in order to develop self-discipline. Number five. Number six, another tip that is given is if you want to be strong-willed, then control your time. How? We are told that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by time. وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ Anir al-Mu'mineen in Nahju al-Balagha says, Allah despises a human being who is bored. And on the day of judgment, this boredom shall be the greatest form of regret. This form of boredom. Islam tells us that when it comes to time, it doesn't belong to you and I, brothers and sisters. Many of us think my time is my time. I spend it the way I like. Wrong! It's a fallacy. It's wrong. The, our time belongs to Allah and He will hold us accountable for every minute of it. Therefore, I cannot say that I will sleep for 16 hours. I cannot say that I'll watch the Olympics and whatever I wish to watch for X amount of hours. There needs to be control. There needs to be discipline. If you want strong willpower, then look at your time. Look at how people in the past have utilized their time like who this great compilation Bihar al-Anwar 140 volumes the majority of it you know when it was written Allama al-Majlisi when he was riding on his camel he was riding on his camel and he's writing al-shaheed al-awwal al-lum'a al damakhshiya when he was in prison he wrote it when he was in the dungeons in other words, people utilize the time at their disposal so that they can advance. If you want to be strong-willed, then do not allow time to pass. Why? Because Rasulullah says, consider time exactly like how you look after wealth. If you have 10 or 20 or 30 pounds in your pocket, you always check if it's there and you haven't lost it, true? However, Rasulullah says time is gold and you need to look after it just like how you look after what? Just like how you look after your wealth and your money. Because time is indeed precious. Especially in the holy month of Ramadan and in the nights of Qadr as we will discuss tomorrow insha'Allah ta'ala. The sixth point in the practical recommendations as far as strengthening willpower and will end here is that Amir al-Mu'mineen salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi states what? He says, رَوِّضُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ بِحُسْنِ الْخُلُوقِ That exercise your souls and develop strong willpower by the exhibition of good moral conduct. Meaning, but how, is it, how wonderful it is for you and I when we come across a situation whereby we can exert revenge. We can show them a piece of our mind yet we hold back. We exercise this patience. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, if you want to have strong willpower, then let your akhlaq be of the highest level. In which way? In any capacity whereby we are tempted, in any situation where we would display our anger. Rasulullah came one day and saw a group of people lifting weights. He said, what is so special about this man? They said, Ya Rasulullah, he is one of the strongest. The Holy Prophet tells them, do you know in the eyes of Allah who is the strongest? The one who can control his anger when he is in a situation to use it. The one who exercises self-control and self-discipline 
and swallows their anger and at the same time pride when they are tempted to do so. Therefore, these recommendations could be taken together with those that are present in scientific studies because we do not have any problems with work that is conducted out there that gives human beings tips about bettering themselves but at the same time we refer to Islamic sources and sometimes we supplement them with recent research from science and what certain individuals who are experts in the fields have mentioned these ideas will help us to understand how the month of Ramadan is the month of the strengthening of willpower because when you and I are fasting we are already one stage ahead in which way food is in front of us water is in front of us nobody's looking at us and we see this wonderful chocolate bar and we see this great juice cold drink in the heat and nobody's looking and if you were to drink it and you would come and you break your fast not a single human being will tell you hold on a minute you broke your fast nobody would know yet you do not do it why because you have developed this willpower to say no despite the fact that the nefs wants it right you're thirsty you want to drink that water you're hungry but you do not do so because you know Allah is watching and it's that realization that you need to take outside the month of Ramadan and apply it that's why the month of Ramadan is a wonderful institution and a university for developing strong willpower and self-discipline and we have a number of great examples in history who displayed these great characteristics of self-discipline and irada such as Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi I want to dedicate these final moments to Qamar Bani Hashim in this night of remembrance of Amir al-Mu'mineen why? how many of us would be in a situation like Abu al-Fadl Abu Fadl where we sit next to water, whereby nobody would blame us if we were to sip some water to get some strength to fight the enemies of Allah and we would throw it away without drinking a single drop. What kind of strength and willpower did Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas have that you and I seek to also develop inside us? The narrations tell us that Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas was not able to continue hearing the cries of the children who wanted water, who were thirsty. He would come to Aba Abdullah and said to him, Sayyidi Aba Abdullah, the cries of the children is too painful. And the hypocrites and the enemies of Allah are there prohibiting us from getting to the water. At least give me permission to get some water for the children. Allow me to go and quench their thirst. We are told that Imam al Hussein, who did not want Abu al Fadl al Abbas to go, Allahu Akbar. What relationship did Imam al Hussein have with his beloved brother? The narrations tell us that he said to him, If you are to go, then go and seek some water. They bid farewell to each other. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas walks to the battlefield. He speaks to those individuals, tries to admonish them, reminds them about the gravity of their actions, yet they do not take heed. He returns, he picks up his horse, he rides on his horse and goes towards the river of Al-Alqami. There are 4,000 soldiers in front of him, yet he disperses them all. He's sits next to the water, he feels the coldness of the water next to his lips. He throws the water remembering the thirst of Aba Abdullah. He returns back after filling the water container. One of his missions is to quench the thirst of the daughters of Hussein, of the children of Hussein. He returns on his way towards the campsite of Aba Abdullah. A man 
man hides behind the tree. He says, by God, I will make his brother mourn for him. When Abel Fadl is busy fighting, this man comes and severs the right arm of Abel Fadl al-Abbas. At that moment, the narrations tell us that Abel Fadl says, Wallah, in qata'atumu yameeni, inni uhami abadan an dini wa an imam sadiq al-yaqini najl al-nabi al-tahir al-amini he continues, he's determined he's strong-willed, he wants to get the water, another man hides behind another palm tree, this time he severs the left arm of Abel Fadl Abel Fadl standing on his horse, he gets the water container and holds it on his mouth, he doesn't know what to do and at that moment uh, Harmala directs an arrow to his holy face uh, it penetrates through the eyes of Abel Fadl another man comes and strikes the head of Abel Fadl with a spear on his head uh, Abel Fadl al-Abbas falls onto the ground uh, how does he fall he does not have arms to help himself fall appropriately uh, he falls using uh, his head on onto his head he cries Akhi Aba Abdullah Alayka min salam Allahu Akbar Aba Abdullah al Hussein. he is the cries of Aba Al-Fal Al-An inkasara dhahri Al-An qallat hilati Al-An shamut bi adui now my back is broken now my enemies are victorious now he moves forward. He comes next to Abel Fal. Abel Fal cannot see him. His face is covered with blood. Imam Al Hussein next to his sits next to his beloved brother. Picks up the head of his beloved brother. Abel Fal says, "Billahi alaik." I ask you in the name of Allah to leave me, to allow my brother to come next to me. Fashumhu wa yashumuni. Let me see my fire, my brother, for the fire final time. Imam al Hussein says, Akhi, Abel Fadl, I am your brother. I've come next to me. I'm next to you. At that moment, Abel Fadl places his head onto the floor, onto the ground. And the Imam al Hussein lifts his head onto his laps. This is repeated three times. Imam al Hussein says to him, Akhi, Abel Fadl, why is it that you're doing this? Abel Fadl says, Akhi, Aba Abdullah, now you place my head on your Lap. But in an hour, who will place your head in their lap? Akhi Aba Abdullah, leave me here. Do not take me back. I have promised Sukaina some water. I do not wish to disappoint them. At that moment, the soul of Abel Fal leaves and departs this world. Imam Al Hussein returns back. When he returns, back to the camp. Sayyida Zainab comes forward. She starts screaming, Aina Akhi, Aina Hamilu Liwaik, where is your standard bearer? Imam al Hussein, according to one narration, doesn't say a thing, doesn't say a word. He goes inside the tent of Abel Fal, takes the pole away, and the tent immediately collapses. They all know that Abel Fal has has been martyred and cry out wa akha wa abbasa ala la'natullahi ala alqawm al-zalimin wa sayya'lamu al-lazina zalamu ayya man qalabin yanqalibun wa al-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen nas'aluka allahumma wa nad'uk bismika al-azim al-a'zam al-a'az al-ajal al-akram ilahi بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين واخذل الكفر والمنافقين اللهم دمر أعداء الدين 
المؤسسين لهذا المجلس الشريف تقبل اللهم أعمالهم وإلى أرواح أمواتهم وأرواح الحاضرين أرواح أموات الحاضرين رحم الله من قرأ الفاتحة تسبقها صلوات